Please standing just a moment, if you will, for prayer. Dear God, we are grateful for this another privilege to be this side of eternity to preach the word of thy Son again. We would ask tonight that you would speak to us in a special way through thy word. With the grand fellowship of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our message tonight, and may the, those who are needy find that which they really need. We pray that you'll heal the sick tonight also, Lord. Get glory to thyself. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. After that wonderful time of fellowship this morning at the full gospel businessman breakfast, we just had great fellowship, and we thank the Lord for that. And now tonight, seeing that many of you are standing, and when we come up, there were people out on the street leaving without room to be in. So we want to hurry up just quick as we can, and I heard from my son who was waiting for me at the door that I, I'm to speak again tomorrow afternoon, I think, at this place. For just a short time, the Lord willing, I will speak on the subject then, why must I be born again? Just a little gospel message shortly, not over 20, 30 minutes, be out for 3.30, so he can go home and rest up again for tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening we expect to have a healing service, and then on through until the following Wednesday night. I wish to read tonight a little scripture just to get the setting of the feeling of the meeting, found over in St. Matthew 12, the 42nd verse, just to get a background of what we want to say, a little context. And the queen from the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now I would like to take the text tonight, if the Lord willing, on the subject of the sin of unbelief. And there's really only one sin, and that is unbelief. Many times we think that sin is drinking and gambling and committing adultery, but that isn't sin. That's just the attributes of unbelief. A man does that and a woman because they do not believe the Lord Jesus. If they believed the Lord Jesus, then they would not do those things. So sin, what we call sin, is the attributes of unbelief, and there's only two spirits that control a man. That's either his faith or unbelief. Each of us tonight is possessed with one or the other of those spirits. And unbelief is such a horrible thing. And Jesus here had just been teaching to the people and upbraiding them because of their unbelief. And in the previous chapter he had said, Thou Sodium and Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works had been done in you, and to Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities, if the mighty works had been done in, in Sodom and Gomorrah that had been done in Capernaum, that it would have been standing to this day. So why wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah standing? They had an angel, they had a message of deliverance. They had a prophecy, the warnings of God, and they failed to receive it. And today Sodom and Gomorrah lays in the bottom of the Dead Sea, not even any ruins of it left. 
That's the result of unbelief. And Jesus said, a greater than that message is here now, and still they don't believe it. And then he referred to, it had just been called Beelzebub. And Beelzebub was supposedly to have been the prince of the devil. And because that he was able to discern the thoughts of the people, telling them where they had been and what they had done, they said he was an uh, evil spirit in him doing that. Could you imagine men and women who had been set under the reading of the scriptures through the years, and it had the great schools of spirit, and it be in a shape so they would see such as that and nail it down as a devil working? When the scriptures had plainly quoted, that's what it would be. And they were so tucked up in their own dogmas and in their own theology until they failed to recognize it. God in all ages has worked through man. And the reason that they didn't believe him because he was doing these great works of God, yet being a man. But it pleases God to manifest himself through his subjects, for God is a spirit. And God was manifesting himself through his Son, the Lord Jesus. And they were trying to say that he made himself God. And they said a man that would do this would be worthy of being stoned or killed capital punishment, which stoning was capital punishment. And they just couldn't see how him being a man could do that. And the world hasn't changed too much. It's still hard for people to see that God is a spirit that works through man. God always has worked through man. All ages, he manifests himself to Moses and to Elijah and to Noah, through Enoch. All through the ages, God manifests himself to his agency, the man. And he promised that in this Gentile age, he would manifest himself to his subject, the church. But the trouble of it is today that each one wants to say that church that he was speaking of means my denomination. And you won't lie to the other fellow. But God doesn't work through denominations. He works through individuals. And we find out here in the previous verse that he's upbraiding and telling these people of their sin of unbelief. He said that spoke of Jonah, and how that Jonah went to a city of 180,000 people, and God sent him down there with a message to those people. And most of us are familiar with the story how that he took a ship to Tarsha, and on his road down, a storm came up. Oh, there's many times that we like to say that Jonah was all out of the will of God, and he might have been according to the commission, but God makes all things work together for good to them that love him. And he turned that disobedient prophet's journey into one of the greatest blessings that we can read of. After the ship was about to sink, they tied his hands and feet and threw him out of the ship, and a big fish come to the water and swallowed him. And anyone knows after a fish eats, he goes to the bottom of the water, and there rest his swimmers on the bottom. Feed your little goldfishes. Watch them, how they go down to the bottom 
After they prowl through the water and get what they want to eat, then they go down and rest their little swimmers on the bottom. All fish does that. And this great fish that God had prepared, which we believe to be a whale, when he had swallowed Jonah, he took off down to the bottom to rest. For it must have been pretty rough swimming up there in a great storm, dashing the water from place to place, but he had found his belly full, so he thought he'd just go down and rest. And I've often thought when I hear people say that, well, I accepted Christ as my Savior, but, you know, I, I just can't live it. Or hear one say, I accepted Christ as my healer, and, uh, oh, I don't know, I, I, I just can't see that my hand's any better. My stomach with the ulcers doesn't feel any better. My head has not ceased to hurt. Then you, just in a mental conception, accepted Christ. When you kept Christ in the heart, no symptoms bother you from then on. No matter what takes place, you still call God's word the truth. Oh, that little sacred place that where man can meet God, as Moses had on the back side of the desert, after 40 years of good schooling, the highest degrees that be, could be given, knowing his position as a deliverer, and as a Hebrew, and know that God had called him for the commission, and yet he knowed more about God in five minutes in the presence of that burning bush than all of his forty years of theology taught him. He was in the presence of God. And every man that goes to the field to preach the gospel should never leave until he has that back-of-the-desert experience. No one could explain that out of your mind. No matter how much they twist the scriptures and say this, that, or the other, if you've ever met God face to face in the true baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's not enough theologians in the world to ever erase it from your memory. Something happened. You were there. When a man gets that place there is no one can explain it away from him. And when a person finds that place in Christ, that faith that says, by his stripes I am healed, there would could not be enough doctors in the world tell you you were fixing to die. No matter what your symptoms are, you still believe it anyhow. Like Abraham, who called those things which were not as though they were. He took God at his word, believing that he was able to perform that what he had promised. The trouble of it is with the church today, we come with hope and instead of faith. Faith is positive. Faith needs no booster. Faith knows what it's talking about. Faith is strong. Faith has hairs on the chest. It's then the rest of them shut up. Symptoms can't even speak at all when real godly faith speaks. It's got the floor. It knows where it's at. It's had an experience. And I hear people say of their symptoms, I think of Jonah. If there was any man who had a right to complain about symptoms, it would have been Jonah. We would thank him to be backslid because he was out of the will of God when he had failed to do what God told him to do. And then he was had his hands tied behind him. He was in the belly of a fish in, out into the stormy ocean with a big tornado on top of the ocean, in the belly of the whale with seaweeds around his neck and vomit. And if he looked this the way it was whale's belly, 
Every way he looked, it was whale's belly. You talk about symptoms, he had them. There's no one here tonight in that condition. But look what that fellow's done. We think he was backslidden and so out of the will of God, and we are perfectly in his will. And under that kind of a setup, he said, they are lying vanities. I won't even look at them. But once more will I look to your holy temple. For he knew that when Solomon dedicated the temple and prayed this prayer to God, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and will look towards this holy temple, then hear their prayer, Lord, and deliver them. And he believed in Solomon's prayer and a temple that was built by man. And under those symptoms and them circumstances, if he could believe Solomon's prayer and a temple that had been made with man, what ought we tonight, under these circumstances, not look to a temple made with hands or an earthly man who prayed? but to the throne of God himself, where Jesus stands at his right hand with his own blood making intercessions upon our confession. When he died for that purpose, we should look away from our symptoms and call those things which are as though they are not. God made the promise. And look what God did for that prophet under those circumstances. He kept him alive three days. Now, we know that the people of Nineveh worshipped idols, and their god of the sea was the whale, and all the fishermen along the bank, and here comes the whale swimming right into the shore and spits the prophet out on the bank, the god producing the prophet. Certainly they would hear it. And as he went through the city preaching, the people who did not know which is right and left hand repented till they put ashes and sackcloth on their animals. And Jesus referred to that, that the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he said, a greater than Jonah is here. And they call him Beelzebub. Then he referred to the queen of the south, which we know to be the queen of Sheba. And now, if you'll measure on your map how far it is from Palestine down to Sheba. Now, in the days of Solomon, God was working again. He's never left these people without a witness. All ages, God has had his gifts in his people. Just get that again. In all ages, God has had his representative on the earth. Never without a witness. And in the days of Solomon, God had given a gift to Solomon. And when God sends such a gift, and if the people turn it down, it becomes a chaos to the people. But if the people receive such a gift, then it is a golden age for that people. And he was trying to let them know that that was their golden age, but they would not receive it. He said, I've come and done the works of God before you, and you don't believe me. He said, watch what happened in the days of Jonah, and watch what happened in the days of Solomon. Now let's take that just for a few minutes, and look at the days of Solomon, when God gave Solomon a great gift of discernment. And all Israel rallied around it. Oh, wouldn't it not be a great day today if all the churches would rally around God's great gift, the Holy Spirit? Would it not be wonderful if we'd just forget our differences and denominations and just rally around the greatest gift that God ever sent to the earth, the Holy Spirit? His son died that he might come. You say the Holy Spirit being a greater gift than Christ, by Christ came the Holy Spirit. 
When they called him Beelzebub, he said, You say that against me, the Son of Man, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost has come and does the same thing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world nor the world to come. And this is a greater day than that was. The Holy Spirit working universally in his church. And wouldn't it be wonderful? It would be like it was in the days of Solomon. And anyone knows that that was Israel's golden millennium in the days of Solomon. They built the temple. All the nations feared them. And today, when we got so much fear and Sputniks in the skies, I see where Russia's put up one successfully down there now. It's over a ton. One of these days, we're going to wake up and we're building shelter rest everywhere. What good is that shelter rest going to do you? When a hydrogen bomb, as I was talking the privilege to some scientist recently, he said, Brother Branham, that bomb will blow a hole in the ground 175 feet deep for 100 miles square. What if you was 500 feet under the ground while the concussion would break every car puzzle out of your body? What if you were hundreds of miles away? It would still do the same. God has made it. There is no hiding place down here except one. And we've got a bomb shelter. It's not made of steel. Or it's not made underneath the earth, it's made out of feathers. Under his wings, we will abide and be raptured before this thing takes place. Safety and secure. And we see that Israel was safe as long as they were rallying around their God. And this must have started a great curiosity everywhere. People passing by would see the unity and the oneness of Israel. And that spread out from nation to nation. It would be the same way in our great, beautiful, lovely country today of America. If all the churches would get together and the Christians put their hearts together, and the people that's called by my name shall assemble themselves together and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. Would it not be a, the greatest scare that Russia ever had when they know that all the Christendom of America had united as one? Certainly it would be. No one can fight against God. And Israel was united like that, and they had no wars. Everybody was scared of them. Not as scared of Israel, but scared of their God. And this passers by from different parts of the world, going from place to place. This news got plumbed down into Sheba. Everybody coming by would say to the little queen down there, Oh, you should be up in Israel. God has sent them a great gift. And it's working. I was present when I seen it manifested. What a thrill that must have been. And you know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word of God. And when this little queen kept hearing different ones say about there was a God up there who had anointed a man with a great gift, her heart began to yearn. The Scripture says that ye are the salt of the earth. And if you want people to thirst after Christ, just be salty. That's all the church has to do. Salt creates a thirst. But if the salt has lost its strength, the church has lost its strength and just become denomination, it's henceforth good for nothing but to be talked about, trod under the feet of man. What a day that we live in. What a rebuke to the people. But prosperity has did it. Now notice, and that made that little queen long to go up there and see about it. Now remember, she was a pagan, a heathen, and in order to go see about it, 
Because something in her heart began to tell her that that must be real. You see, she belonged to church. And she had priests and, and bishops and so forth. But all of her church was just the intellectual. Just a bunch of theology. And she heard that there was a God who lived and manifested himself. God be merciful. What good does a historical God do if he isn't the same today? If the fire of Pentecost ain't just as good today as it was then, what good does it do to talk about it? What if a man was freezing to death and you painted him a fire and said one day the fire burnt? That won't make him warm. He don't want a painted historical fire. If he's freezing, he wants fire burning. And if the people who read the Bible don't want something of God that lived in a day gone by, let's have a God of today who's just the same as he was then. We need a God that's present tense. What good does it do to preach the Bible if God's a mute and won't answer his promise? What good would it do to feed your canary bird vitamin B, vitamin A, to make his wings strong and keep him in a cage all the time? You don't let him out. What good does your vitamins do? What good does all of our seminaries and schools of theology and our great preachers with DD, PhD, and double LD? What good does that do if it's all on a historical God that doesn't live and act the same today as they teach about that did happen? The Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not dead. He's raised from the dead and is alive forevermore. Ever present, omnipresent forever. That's the God that we want to hear about. That's the God that every true elected son of Abraham wants to hear about and wants to know about. When I landed in India, the bishop of the Methodist Church and many of them met us. They said, Brother Branham, don't come over here as a missionary. We know more about the Bible than you Yankees ever will know, and that's true. It's an Eastern book. We're trying to understand it with Western education. He said, but what we hear, that God has visited you Yankees with the gift that will make God real and make his Bible live again. That's what we want to see. That's when tens of thousands times thousands came to Christ at one time. They want a living reality. If God is so great in another age, why ain't he the same tonight? What good is he if he's history and not present? And this little queen had the same subject. We've got gods in the temple that was supposed to be been from some time. we got the best educated priest there is. But they speak and their God doesn't answer. But I hear that there is a God. Faith cometh by hearing. I hear there is a God who loves his people and manifested himself among his people. I'd like to go see him. Oh, that blessed, holy thirst in a man or woman's heart, the thirst after righteousness. The scripture says you shall be filled. Now look what she had to do. Well, if she went to her priest and said, would you excuse me for a few months? I wish to go up in Israel to see if this God lives that they're talking about that sent a gift in his servant called Solomon. I would like to go up there and see it. See it manifested. Well, of course those priests would not let her go. You know, our church is not cooperating in that revival up there. But if that great holy thirst is in the woman's heart, she'll go anyhow. Right. Nothing can stand in the way. So God had been speaking to the little lady's heart. 
And she knew that she'd be excommunicated. But what could she be excommunicated from? What did she have to lose? She only had a bunch of creeds. And now she's going because she's heard that there is a God who lives and acts among his people. So she started making ready. Now the first thing, she had a lot to come up against. First place, being a woman. Another place was, another thing, that there was a long journey between her country and the country where the gift was. If you count the miles, it's estimated that it's taken three months for her to get there. Not in an air-conditioned Cadillac, but on the back of a camel. No wonder Jesus said she'll stand in the judgment and condemn this generation. We won't come across the street to hear it with Cadillacs and all kinds of transportation. And each of us are going to stand in the judgment with that woman. She had three months on the back of a camel. But she was determined to see whether it was right or not. If her priest told her they wasn't cooperating with that, that would have settled it. But she was going to see for herself. She was going to do like we said in the message last night, that Nathaniel or Philip told Nathaniel, come and see if any good thing could come out of Nazareth. Don't stay home and criticize. Come find out. Don't go critical. Sit down. Take the scriptures and see if it's right. That's the only way to know truth. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. That's what Jesus said. So the little woman said in her heart, I'm going up there, and I'm going to find out for myself. And if it is so, I'm going to support it. She took camels laden with gold and stones and frankincense and myrrh and all kinds of costly gifts. If it was really God, it's worth supporting. If it isn't God, it's not worth supporting. The woman had something. Now, it had to be real. She said, I got some things in my heart. I'm going to find out. So she loaded up her camels and got all of her servants ready. Now, here's another thing confronted her. With all that gold on those camels and all that costly stones, and she had the desert to go through for 90 days, three months, on the back of a camel, and in the desert, Ishmael's children was there, which was robbers. What a setup that would be for them. How easy could they run in on that little woman with her little caravan there of a few soldiers, eunuchs, temple guards, and just slaw them down? But you know, there's something about faith doesn't know any fear. If faith is calling, you don't consider any fear or any doubt. You just go on. God's calling you. Nothing can stop it. She never thought about the fear because she was going to see a true and living God who was manifesting himself. And away she went on the camels. And when she arrived at the gate, now, she didn't come just to go over and she pitched her tent. And the next morning, she took her position. So watch the gift of God work. She said, now has come the time. I've come for a long way, so I am coming now to see whether that gift really works or not. And she didn't come just to stay a couple of hours. She didn't come just for one meeting. She didn't come. She said, now, I'll go in and sit down, and the first time that preacher says anything at my church don't teach, I'll get up and stomp out. That either shows a literacy or not right kind of a raisin or a controlled mind by a devil. That's the only thing it declares. She come no matter how different it seemed. 
She was going to see if it worked. We can talk about a lot of things, but does it work? That's the next. So she just camped out at the gate. I like that. Stay till it's over. Find out about it. I can see her with the scrolls, reading them down, seeing the promises that God had made, see if these things compared with it. There she was. What do you think taking place on that first morning, that little queen, way back in the congregation, when she seen a man or a woman or someone come up before Solomon, just a man, and saw that great gift of discernment go to work? She must have said, that's just the way I heard it. And she stayed day after day till her turn come. And when she stood before Solomon, the gift of God worked on her. For she said, Solomon made known to her every question in her heart. And she believed. And she stood among the people, publicly and openly, and said, All that I heard about you is the truth, and more than that I heard is truth. Jesus said she'll rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because she came from the utmost parts of the world to see a gift like that. What about now, when we've got her experience? We've got thousands of years later with all kinds of experiences of a living God. God still lives. He's just as real today as he was then. When he made himself known to Philip, when Peter came into the meeting and he told him, Your name is Simon or Cephas, and your father's name is Jonas. And when they went and got a man and brought him to Jesus, he said, You are an Israelite, and whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, you're the King of Israel. What did those who stood by the Jews say? That's Beelzebub, he's a fortune teller. When he went into Samaria and the woman come out to get a drink at the well or get her water, when Jesus said to her, woman, bring me a drink, she said, it's not customary for you Jews to talk to we Samaritans. I'm a woman of Samaria. And he said, if you knew who he was speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. He talked to the woman till he found where her trouble was and said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. said, you've had five. And the one that you now have is not your husband. You said, well, she didn't say he was a devil or Beelzebub. I quote this again. She knows more about God than 90% of the preachers in America knows tonight. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Spiritual, she's used to it. Been taught it. We know. We Samaritans know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us all these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into a city of her own city, Samaria, and said, come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Christ? That was not done to the Gentiles in them days. It is now. That's where he declared himself then. Now. And if the queen of Sheba would stand in that generation and condemn them. Oh, hear me, people. If the queen of the south, Jesus said, would stand and condemn that generation, and we've had 2,000 years of teaching on that, and here he is doing the same thing tonight, what will she do with this generation when she testifies? Think of it. We that say that we're good and go to church, what is the sin is unbelief. No matter how religious you are, just so good you wouldn't do this, that, or the other, the Mohammeds are the same, Buddha's the same. Religion is one thing, salvation's another. 
Religion is a covering. Salvation is a gift of God. She'll stand and condemn this generation. Why? She stood when she seen that gift of God working through a man. She said, that's the truth. And she accepted Jehovah as her God. Then the eunuch taking the message down after Pentecost to the people of the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what are you going to do if God makes his stand? And if you make your stand, here some years ago in the middle of America, there was a preacher by the name of Daniel Greenfield, a great mighty minister. Many of you clergymen has read his book. And one night he had a dream. And on this such night that he had a dream, he thought he went, he died and he went up to heaven. And when he got to the gate, the gatekeeper come out and he said, who approaches this place? And he said, I'm Daniel Greenfield. I did an evangelist from America. So just a moment, Mr. Greenfield, I'll see if I can let you in, if your name's on my book. All right. He looked the book over, he came back and he said, sir, I'm sorry, but your name is not on the book. You must depart. Oh, he said, surely you're wrong. I preach the gospel. I live the good life. He said, surely my name is on the book. I'm sorry, he said. It's not here. He said, what shall I do then? He said, you might appeal your case to the great white throne judgment. Well, he said, I have no choice. Then I must do it. And he said, see, Mike, he began to move through the air at a terrific speed. And he came into the presence of a light. And as the light got brighter, he got slower, slowing up. After a while, he come to a still stop. The light was not coming from any certain place, but it's just all around him. Oh, he said such a feeling to stand in that presence. And there was a voice came from the light and said, Who approaches my throne? Like a great thunder coming out. And he said, Oh, God, Jehovah, I am the evangelist Dan Greenfield. I was turned away from the gates of heaven, and I was asked to appeal my case at your justice. Very well, he said, I will try you by my law. He said, Daniel Greenfield, did you ever tell a lie? He said, to that time I thought I'd been at least an honest man, truthful. But said, oh, then in that presence, I seen that I told him any little thing was kind of crooked, had a double meaning. He said, yes, Lord, I've lied. He said, Daniel Greenfield, did you ever steal? He said, of anything I thought I'd been, would have been honest. But in the presence of that light, I remembered a many a little deal that I pulled that was shady. Brother, sister, in, the, in your church, around your neighbor, in presence of your pastor, you may seem pretty good, but wait till you're in the presence of that light. That perfect line. Then he said he heard a voice come again and said, Daniel Greenfield, my justice requires perfection. Were you perfect in your life? He said, no, Lord, I wasn't perfect. And said, I was just ready to hear that great blast come. Said, see, my, my bones had disconnected and I was shaking like I could not stop. So then I heard a voice. It was the sweetest voice I ever heard. Said no mother could speak like that. And said I turned to look and I saw the sweetest face that I ever saw. 
and said he walked up and put his arms around me. And he said, Father, that's true. Daniel Greenfield wasn't perfect in his life. But there's one thing that he did in his life. He stood for me down on earth. So here in heaven, I'll stand for him. I wonder tonight, friend, while we're a group of people maybe facing each other for the last time as mortals, if you should die tonight, who would stand for you? Your church, your pastor, your mother, your father. Let me introduce you to one. If you'll stand for him tonight, he'll stand for you then. Think of it while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. And just before we have this prayer, I want you to be real honest, young and old. And the sacredness of this minute. Have you never met him face to face and spoke to him about your sins and know that he has forgiven you of your sins? You may have joined church. That's all right. You may have been baptized according to your creed or what more. You might know all your catechism. And you might be a very good scholar of the Scripture. But do you know him? If you don't, will you be real honest now with God? And if you haven't and God is speaking to you now, God the Holy Spirit, which is present, if he's speaking to you just now saying, Child, you know you're wrong. If you have a heart attack tonight and die, you know you couldn't stand in my presence. Except my son now. And by raising up your hand, just say, God, remember me. I want your mercies now. And by my hand, I mean that I'll stand for you if you'll help me now. Will you raise your hand all over the building? God bless you, you, you. The balcony is to my left up here. Raise your hand. God be merciful. The balcony is to the rear. Would you raise your hand? Someone would say, God be merciful. The balcony to the right. Now, don't be ashamed. If you, God bless you, sister. If you're ashamed of me before man, I will be ashamed of you before my Father and the holy angels. Think of it. No matter how good, how much you've done, that won't mean one thing in the presence of God. You either stand for Christ or you don't stand for Christ. Some 20 or 30 hands has been up. Would there just be some more just for a moment? While we have our heads bowed, I'm going to ask the organist if he'll give us just a little card on the organ. Let Christians pray. God bless you here, sister. Let no one look. Just keep your head bowed. Now, friends, in the presence of God, knowing this, that someday I'm going to have to stand right by his side and give an account for the message tonight, and you will too. I'm offering you tonight, by the grace of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away all the sins of the world. Would you stand for him tonight, that he would stand for you on that day? God bless you, sir, over there. That's good. Someone else who would raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me. Now, it's up to you. God bless you, sir. That's a good stand. God bless you up here, sister, young woman. God bless you, sir, back there. God sees your hand. Be merciful to me, oh God, I really need you. I want to say something. With your heads bowed, everybody praying. No one knows, young or old, when you're going. But it was appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Would it not be sad if you got up there and found out that you had been wrong? God bless you here, lady. You'll see your hand. I'm just waiting a minute. Don't be callous. Be soft in heart. You know, the world's, the so-called church has pulled its hearts through old television programs and radio and uncensored program and read old true story magazines till their hearts just as callous and black. No more tenderness, no more tears. Women can't blush no more. There's no more shame before man. Isn't it a pitiful time? But this has to come 
just before certain, certain Sputnik does its work. God said it would. Oh, if you're in that condition tonight, sinner friend, press your way beyond that and accept Jesus. Some time ago, I was speaking to a girl. I felt led just to say something to her, and I said, Sister, as the service is over, I said, would you come to Christ? She said, I belong to church, and if I wanted somebody to speak to me, I'd get a pastor that had some sense. But don't you try to ever embarrass me. I said, very well, I'm sorry. No one knows this but you and I. I didn't mean to embarrass you. I only asked you because I said I felt led. Standing by the side of a little old rose bush by a Baptist church down in Nashville, Tennessee. Never forget the night, the wind blowing, moon shining. And she turned her little painted lips up and her little nose and snickled away. Met up with a bunch of boys. About a year later, I passed through the same city, was down there having a campaign. And as I was walking down the street, I seen a young lady walking down the street with her skirts terrible. I looked at her and I thought, surely that's not her. And I turned and started following her. She looked at me as it passed. I caught up with her. She said, hello, preacher. I said, how do you do? Aren't you? The she said, I am. She stopped and reached in her pocketbook, pulled out a cigarette, said, have one. I said, shame on you. She said, well, maybe you'd take a little drink out of my bottle. I said, does your father know this, a deacon at the church? And she said, I want to tell you something, preacher. You remember that night you spoke to me by that bush? I said, I'll never forget it. She said, that was my last call. And here's the remark that that beautiful young woman made. She got in this modern teenage rock and roll stuff. And she said, preacher, my heart is so hard that I could see my mother's soul frying hell like a pancake and laugh at it. Done cross the line between mercy and judgment. Oh, don't do it, friend. Young people, won't you accept Christ tonight while we wait just a moment longer? Raise your hands. Will you say, God bless you. That's good. That's fine. Many more raise their hands. Good. Let us praise him. Eternal and blessed God, knowing that this is just not to be standing in this meeting tonight, the word of God has been preached and the Holy Spirit is present. And it's written, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Many hands has went up. That shows they've made a decision. Science says their hands has to hang down. But there's a spirit in them that defied the laws of science and raised their hands to a decision to their maker. They are the love gifts of God. And they are love gifts to Christ that God gives them to Christ. No man can pluck them from his hand. Thou givest them eternal life and shall raise them up at the last day. Grant, Lord, that their souls may be sweet and honeyed by the presence of the Holy Ghost until death shall set them free and come into the presence of God. Covered by his blood, washed and made new again. Lord God, let the Holy Spirit do that just now and present them to the Lord Jesus as sainted, baptized people into the body of Christ. We ask that in his name and for his glory, amen. Let's just sing one verse of that Savior. Savior, hear my humble cry. How many feels real good? Just raise your hands. Feel that God is here. Don't you just love the presence of the Holy Ghost? Now, real sanely, reverently, and spiritually, let's just raise our hands and sing Fanny Crosby's precious old song. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. 
Whom have thou on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? Let's sing it now. Savior, Savior. you just love him? This is the time the message is over. Now it's worship time. Let's sing this glorious old hymn of the church. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away and let me from this day be holy thine. How many knows it? Let's sing it in the spirit now of worship. Why do you just worship the Lord now? All right. Savior, Savior, hear my cry. For all That went forth like that. I wonder if somebody is lingering in the building that should have raised their hands just a few moments ago that now really wants God to do something for you. Raise your hand. Will you do it? God bless you. God makes no mistakes, you know. God bless you, sister. May he grant to you that. See, God makes no mistakes. He's perfect in all his doing. If we'll just follow the leading of the Spirit. Now, my faith looks up to thee. All right, brother, if you will. Everybody together now. All right. Hey, faith looks up to thee. about worshiping in the Spirit, the goodness and gentleness of the dove, the Holy Ghost, bringing peace. Oh, I just, let's sing another verse of that. While life's dark made I tread, just look to him now, and grief around me spread. I'll be now my guide. It's dark now, turn to day. Oh, I sorrow tears away. No, let me ever spray. God, as the music is sweetly going out and the people humming this gracious old song that our fathers sang years ago, that's done gone up to glory and in your presence, let the angels take their position, their places tonight along these lines of people and help us now to recognize your 
ominous presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and grant unto us, Lord, our desire in our heart. And may when we get ready to leave the building tonight, may we be able to say like those who came from Emmaus, after the first resurrection, they walked along the road talking about the scripture and Jesus appeared. And they didn't know who he was. But he walked with them and comforted them by the scripture all day. And when nighttime came, they went on the inside of the building and asked him to come in. That's what we've done, Lord. And when you got the door shut and, and sat down with them, you did something just like you did before your crucifixion. They recognized by that miracle that you did that it was you. And you vanished out of their sight, but quickly they ran and said, Did not our hearts burn within us? As he spoke to us along the road, they went to their own company and declared that they had seen that same Jesus that had been crucified, that had risen again, and was doing the same things that he did before his crucifixion. Lord, do the same for us tonight. Grant it, give us a scripture now, and work, Holy Spirit, by this scripture. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you will, for a few minutes, be real quiet. How many that's in divine presence has never been in one of my meetings before? Let's see your hand. My, 90% of the crowd. I suppose Dr. Vail tonight, I'm not a preacher, you know that, but I'm, God has given me another way to work with his church. And that is by a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to give you a scripture which he has probably told you of many. How many knows that this Jesus said himself that he could do nothing in himself? But what he saw the Father doing, St. John 5, 19. Then Jesus never did one miracle until he saw the Father do it by vision, first according to his word. Right. When Philip came to him, he went and got Nathaniel and brought him back and told Nathaniel who they had found. And Nathaniel could not believe it. But when he came into the presence of the Messiah, Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. He could have been an Arab, he could have been a Greek, he could have been anything else, they all dressed alike. But Jesus knew he was a Jew and was an honest and just man. And the man said to him, when did you know me, Rabbi? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. That's 15 miles away a day before. And when he did this, he said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God, you're the King of Israel. He told the different ones. How many knows that that's the way he declared himself in the days gone by? How many knows that he promised that the works that he did, his church would do also? A little while in the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, that's a personal pronoun, I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. And as the Father has sent me, so send I you. The Father that sent him went with him and was in him. The Jesus that sends the church goes with it and is in it. How many knows that that Jesus that was here on earth was the angel of the Lord that was in a pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness? All Bible students know that. He said, they said, you're a man not 50 years old yet, and you said you saw Abraham. We know that you're a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And that was the pillar of fire that was in the bush that talked to Moses. When he was sure, God in Christ was united in one, a body called Jesus. And then when he worked on the earth and done the things that he did, he said, I came from God and I go to God. Is that right? Then whatever he was before he was flesh, he returned back to it. That's according to his word. After his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, 
Paul, Saul rather, was on his road to Damascus to arrest some people that were making too much noise and carrying on. So just before he got to Damascus, there was a great light that shined in his face and blinded him. And a voice cried out and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Is that true? Then he had turned back to the pillar of fire again. Is that right? Come from God, went to God. Now, if we see that, in this picture as I say, hide myself, it's not me. It's him. They've told you about it at your Washington, D.C. as the only supernatural being was ever photographed in all the world's history. Now, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Now, the vine doesn't bear fruit, the branch bears fruit. And the branch will certainly bear the fruit of the vine. Is that true? Grafted or whatever it may be? It's got to bear the life of the vine because it's living from the vine. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you also. Well then, if ye abide me in my word and you ask what you will and be given, then notice, would a peach tree bear peaches? A grapevine would bear grapes. A watermelon would bear watermelon. The Spirit of Christ will bear the life of Christ. Does the Scripture say he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he declared himself in thus manner, as we have just said, before the Jews and the Samaritans, and forbid it to be done to the Gentiles, 2,000 years of Gentile church theology, you see where we've got. But isn't he obligated to declare himself the same to the Gentiles as he did to them? As I said last night, God doesn't get any smarter. His first decision is perfect and it's forever. When an occasion arises and God acts, and that same occasion would arise again, God's got to act in the same manner as he did the first time, or he acted wrong the first time. He can't be different. He has to be the same. So let me give you another scripture. Now, something comes on my heart. Last evening, we called prayer cards up here, people who had cards with numbers on them. And they come up to the platform, and the Lord God was here to make known and to heal the people just like he did at the beginning. All that was sure to see that, raise up your hands and notes, that's true. I'm going to give you another scripture tonight. And we'll differ, the Lord willing. Now there was a little weak woman in the Bible who thought and believed, yet without seeing him, that he was the Son of God, so you see, it's your approach to God what brings the result. As I said, there's a Roman put a, a ro rag around his head and hit him on the head with a stick and said, you prophesier, tell us who hits you, we'll believe you. He didn't feel any virtue. But there was a little woman who pressed to the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made well. A little woman who'd had an issue of blood for many years. Nothing could help her. And when she touched him, she went off into the audience. Maybe she sat down or stood up. I don't know. But anyhow, she was out in the audience of people. Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? How many knows that's a scripture? Who touched me? And Peter rebuked him. He said, Why, well, everybody's touching you. In other words, pat him and how do you do it? Glad to see you, Rabbi. Have you come for a revival? Peter said, everybody's touched you. Why do you say things like that? Jesus said, but I got weak. Virtue has gone from me. And he looked around until he found the little woman. And he said to her, her trouble, that her faith had made her well. Is that right? How many knows that Jesus Christ tonight, according to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that he is now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity? Well, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if, you, if he's a high priest that can be touched, would he not have to act the same that he did yesterday? How many would believe that? 
same yesterday. Now what you'd have to do would be touch it with your face, like the woman did, not with your hands. It wasn't her, her hands that he felt. It was her face that he felt. And he turned around. And if he's the same tonight, in here, the same pillar of fire, if this is him, his picture, and if it is, it'll bear record of him. If it isn't, it won't. For God testifies of his own gifts. Hebrews 11, 1 says so. Now, and if he's the high priest, and we don't call anybody up here to platform, you just out there in the audience, balcony, wherever you are, if you believe God with all your heart, don't doubt one bit in your heart, but just touch him, he'll act tonight just the same as he did then, or he isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, friends, it's too long that just theology and building churches and having denominations and baptizing people forward, backward, up, down, three times, whatever more, that doesn't mean anything. What good does our theology do if it doesn't produce the Christ? He lives. And if he will do such a thing tonight, how many will love him and believe him and accept him? Raise your hands to him. He knows every person. I can't see all your hands, of course. The Lord bless you. Now, I suppose that every person in front of me is strange to How many knows that I do not know you? Raise your hand. That I do not know you. The only ones I know is uh, this brother standing here. I can't call White Cloud or McLeod or something like that. That's his name. <laughs> We've got a White Cloud in Jeffersonville. I guess that was the wrong one. Matt Cloud. <laughs> Dr. Vale. Brother Sweet, that's all that I know. But the Lord God knows you all. And now what good would my message do tonight to tell you about a woman who came to see a gift that God had put in a man, Solomon, that's going to condemn that generation because Jesus was there and claims to be the same in his scripture if he doesn't come and do the same thing tonight? How could she be condemned? But if he does it, and then you don't believe him, then you will be condemned. For that's why he condemned that generation of doing the very same thing that I'm speaking of him now. Now, I want you all to pray and to believe with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, that God is present. And now, don't move around now, please. Just be real reverent. This would be far beyond bringing you to the platform. How many here doesn't have prayer cards? Let's see, you're sick. I want to see just, there'd be no way of telling. I can't say with or without prayer cards. You just, you just believe. And God surely will answer prayer. Jesus said, if thou canst believe. Just everyone, Reverend. I just touch, say, Lord God, say this in your prayer. Lord God, let me, O oh Lord, I am in need. I love you. I believe what the man says is the truth. Because it comes from the Bible. And in the Old Testament, when it flashed on the Urim Thundum, it was true. The Urim Thundum of that day, Aaron's breastplate, is gone away. But God's got another Urim Thundum, his word. And if it flashes from his word to you, then it's true. If thou canst believe. Just be reverent, reaching up by faith and saying, Lord God, high priest, I'm sick and needy. Just touch me, Lord, and I'll never doubt no more. It'll take all fear away from me and will help me. See, it's, it's anointing 
I'm waiting and you're waiting. Something's got to happen, or the word's wrong, or I'm wrong. The Bible said so, so it would make the word wrong, too. He promised it. I'm trying to just watch. It's the angel of the Lord, the light, that I'm watched for. It comes to the person that I watch in a vision come. The same God that lived in the days gone by is the same God today. It's being worshipped. I'm sure that Christians can appreciate stand me standing here. Please now, real reverend, real reverend, be real quiet. Don't move around. You interrupt. what hurts. Surely the God of heaven will overrule. He knows our love and our worship. Lord, I just preached the word, God. I'm not responsible for the word. I'm just responsible for saying what you have said. And I'm asking you to perform that which you did when you were on earth, that these people, many fine Christians here tonight, who believe you, Lord, if you would just do it once for us, just let the people know by a true token that you're alive. Speak to some heart, Lord, find faith here somewhere. Reverently, here it is. The angel of the Lord is hanging over a lady right out here to my left. She's suffering with trouble with her feet and her legs. That is right. That Mrs. Tilton, that's your name, isn't it? Stand up to your feet. I do not know you, do I? Never seen in my life. You are healed. You touch the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of your infirmity. Oh, how we thank our Lord. Now be real reverent. Somehow the light still hangs to the woman. She was sitting there praying. Lord, let it be me. If that's right, wave your hand back and forth, ladies, so they can see you. There you are. God in heaven knows that my Bible, I've never seen the woman in my life. How would he know her and what her trouble was and who she was? If that ain't the same thing he did in the Bible, then I don't know the Bible. How many believe it? Say amen. amen. Fine. Be reverent. You shall see more, if the Lord will. Now, up in the balconies, keep praying. All right, no matter where you are, just keep praying. Somehow that light is still hanging over the woman. But it's something else that's wrong. No, it isn't. It's the next woman to her. And that woman has a a growth on the breast. That's right, lady. Stand to your feet just a minute so I can catch your spirit. And that growth is on your left breast. That's right. You're Mrs. Woodward. Return home and get well. Don't fear about that cancer. Jesus Christ heals the sick and the afflicted if thou canst believe. There it goes to a little lady, kind of aged, with a little stripe around her hat, sitting 
just about two rows behind there, is coming down to her at this time. She's suffering with gallbladder trouble. Do you believe, lady, that the Lord will heal you? On the end of the row. You've got heart trouble, too, sitting at the, yes, ma'am. Do you believe that he makes you well? You were praying, the reason you didn't get me. You were praying, suffering with galls, trouble, and with heart trouble. That's right. Raise your hands if that's right. You're sitting there praying. It was a double thing. The lady sitting next to you has gallbladder trouble also. Sitting next to you, stand on your feet, lady, because it has left both of you. Amen. Turn light. What did they touch? They touched the high priest. But they're 20 yards from me. It isn't me. It's the Christ. He bears record of himself. He's the high priest. He still lives tonight. You are praising the Lord sitting there, sir. You have diabetes. I don't know you, do I? Stand to your feet just a minute. Just stay right there. There's something wrong in your... Yeah, diabetes. Something wrong in your blood. Do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant with all your heart? I believe that. I cannot heal you, sir. I have no way of healing you. But you touch something that's brought... You're aware that something's going on. Exactly. You're not from this city. You're not from this city. You're from a place called Pittsfield, Maine. That's right. Your name is Mr. Silas Perkins. That's exactly right. Thus saith the Lord. That's right. Do you believe? Go home and be well, then. Accept your healing. And go home and be made well. A little lady there with a the little thing on her dark dress. She's suffering with ulcers. And do you believe me to be his prophet, his servant? You also have varicose veins. That's right. Raise up your hand. Do you believe now? Get well. If Jesus Christ, if you I got faith enough to touch him, surely you have faith enough to accept him now. If thou canst believe, what do you think sitting there praying at that black back trouble sitting there, sir? Do you believe that God will heal you of it? You do? Stand up and accept it. Do you believe? There's a lady sitting in front of you with her hand up like this, suffering with a chest trouble. That's right. You're praying for your husband sitting next to you, too. He drinks. You won't get a That's right. Oh, that's thus saith the Lord. That could be his bread, too. That's right. Sir, accept it now. That thing will leave you. You don't want to do that. You're too much of a gentleman for that. Believe me. How many of you believe with all your heart? Do you believe his presence is here? Then the Christ that stood and said that the Queen of Sheba would stand in the last days and condemn the generation that's seen him do that. And here he is at the end of the Gentile age doing the same. Now, there's no man can heal you. Healing is already done by God. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. The only thing that anyone can do is to get you to accept something that he's already done. Do you believe that? The scripture does say these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that right? Or how many believers have we got? Raise up your hands. Then lay your hands on one another. If you're believers, let's prove it to God you are a believer. Up in the balcony. You, sir, has got that prostrate trouble sitting out there by that post. It's all over now. You can go home. It's well. That young lady there with that TV, it's finished. 
Oh, don't you understand that his presence is here? You're in the presence of the living God, not a man, but a real God who didn't live only 2,000 years ago, but lives tonight, right here in his presence now. Oh, Lord God, you see their hands laying on each other. And I pray that you'll give them faith. What more could you do, Lord? You've declared yourself to be here. And I ask that a great spontaneous power of the Holy Ghost will surge through this people just now and heal every person that's in divine presence. Satan, you have held them captive so long. But you're exposed tonight. Jesus is coming soon for our church. And he's trying to give them rapture and faith. Come out of this audience, thou spirit of the devil that's bound him. I adjure thee by the living God that you come out. In the name of Jesus Christ. Every person here, no matter how crippled, whatever you was, if you believe Jesus Christ to be here in his presence, stand up to your feet. I don't care who you are. Stand up, wave your crippled hands to the air. Now it's all over. You are healed. 